If you ever said that you understand or accept evolution and you live in the U.S., then someone who doesn't understand or accept evolution has probably asked you to show them a transitional or intermediate form. And if there's a problem trying to communicate an answer to that, it may not be that you didn't understand the question. It's far more likely that they didn't understand their own question. To my experience, those who reject evolution and refuse to look at the evidence but demand to see it anyway are most often asking for something absurd, like a half-formed freak or a strange chimera across separated clades, like a half-lion, half-eagle sort of thing. At best, they might be asking for a common ancestor between two groups, and we don't name common ancestors because without genetic evidence, there's no way to be that specific. If all we have is fossils, then um, we can only show the more generalized ancestral form that a potential common ancestor should have. Even if you have a perfect example of what would likely be that, there's always the possibility that you could find something else later on that is even closer. Is it that exact species or a similar sister group? And if it is that species, it's almost certainly not the particular individual that you happen to find. And sometimes critics will ask for a direct ancestor, as in the exact child of the previous species and the parent of the next one. But we're dealing with vast populations, not individual bloodlines. We're not looking for some great, great times a thousand grandmother. We're looking at intermediate forms and features. A transitional form is one that looks like it's intermediate between two lineages, meaning that it has some characteristics of lineage A, some characteristics of lineage B, and probably some characteristics partway between the two. Now, this applies both to the generalized archetype as, of, as compared to what appears to be subsequent variations on that template, or it could be an intermediate taxa in a linear development from an ancestral condition to a particular daughter type. Even if it's not directly ancestral, but is at least apparently in a closely related side branch, like a cousin of sorts. And today we're talking about both types, not an individual or even a species, but essentially an infraclass of mammals whose general form or the basis thereof is intermediate between modern eutherian mammals who give birth in placenta and their ancient forerunners, the monotremes who lay eggs. As to how to predict what that form is, we refer to the principle of evo-devo, noticing that the more closely related two animals are, the more similar they will be. And the young of two closely related animals look more alike than the adults do, because the adults, both in the individual and population level, continue to diversify. And that also means that the more primitive form will be the more generalized, while derivations from that are often specialized in different directions. Transitional forms can occur between groups of any taxonomic level, such as between species, between genera, families, orders, etc. Ideally, a transitional fossil should be found stratigraphically between the first occurrence of the ancestral lineage and the first occurrence of the descendant lineage, and that general rule applies here too. So what group are we talking about today? Metatherians are a clade proposed by T.H. Huxley in 1880. It was meant to be a parent category of marsupials, but that also includes intermediate forms between marsupials and monotremes. And marsupials actually count as an intermediate form between eutherians and monotremes. Remember that monotremes count as transitional too. In the evolution of mammals from what we used to think of as reptiles, we start with what is already a long sequence of transitional forms in fine gradation, where there are a suite of changes, traits that are not simply on or off like that mammals have warm blood, while reptiles are typically cold-blooded. Monotremes are technically warm-blooded, but they have the lowest body temperature of all other mammals. Metatherians have a higher metabolism than monotremes, but again, not as high as eutherians. And marsupials' metabolic rates are about 30% lower than comparably sized placentals. So that's another intermediate trait. Likewise, the mammal clade is named for their mammary glands, being the only animals to produce milk. The monotremes produce milk, but they don't have nipples like more advanced mammals do. They simply sweat their milk out of their pores and their abdomen. So that's another intermediate trait, as is the fact that modern monotremes have their legs in a splayed position, more like that of lizards or crocodiles than typical mammals. Then all other living mammals are viviparous, giving birth to live young, whereas monotremes are oviparous, laying eggs. But their eggs hatch in a matter of days after birth, more quickly than most birds or reptiles. So it's, it's closer to a live birth. And uh, the hatchlings are not as developed as most other animals. 
And this is where we see a transition, not just in the linear progression between viviparous and oviparous, but also the divergence between metatherians leading to marsupials and eutherians leading to placental mammals like us. What we call monotremes today are simply the last remnants of what was once a much larger group, or rather several different groups of mammals that have all gone extinct except for the platypus and the echidna. Their lineage broke off from the one leading to us way back, almost at the dawn of mammals. What evidently happened after that is the emergence of theriomorphs. That's a lineage of mammals that grew external ears. Because another intermediate feature about monotremes is that they're the only mammals left that don't have any pinea, you know, externally visible ear appendages. Then later on, their descendants, the theriomorph descendants, produced trechnith ears, and they continued to diversify with some sets making subtle improvements to their limbs and joints to move more efficiently than monotremes can. And these led to cladith ears, another descendant lineage, marked by a 270 degree coil in their auditory canal, which improves both their hearing and balance. Again, all modern mammals have this except for the monotremes. Then one of the cladotherian descendant lineage, zatherians, finally got around to focusing their milk production through doubled rows of nipples. And then there was an important change in the development where the vagina and colon were previously both the same hole, called a cloaca, on all previous mammals and reptiles as well, including birds. And tribosphenidids are where that channel changed into two separate passages. And then finally we get to theria, the great, great, great grandchild clade of the common ancestry between our lineage and that of the metatherians. And this genetic study of different groups of living mammals estimates a divergence of the lineages leading to monotremes and tetherians at 231 to 217 million years ago in the Upper Triassic period. And then the therian line itself diverged in toward metatherians and eutherians at 193 to 186 million years ago in the Lower Jurassic period. And sadly, none of these other precursor species still exist, except for Theria, the one lineage that ultimately led to us and to all other mammals apart from the monotremes. Well, all of this evolution is indicated in the genome, and we still have living examples of intermediate forms within each of these groups. The transitions between them exist now only as fossils, although their radiometric dates are consistent with estimates based on the molecular clock. So what happened? What was the common ancestral situation, and how have each of the main daughter groups grown apart since then? The primary difference is developmental, how they give birth. All but the most primitive type animals come from eggs of one type or another. Thus, all mammals come from eggs, too. It's the differences in these eggs that decide which group we're talking about. Ammonotremes lay tiny eggs with rubbery shells, which hatch quickly. But the young inside are not like lizards or crocodiles or turtles that are just smaller, cuter versions of their parents. It's more like when, when birds hatch, they're underdeveloped, helpless, having to rely on their parents until their growth catches up, rather like humans. With monotremes, though, it's even worse. What comes out of their eggs is essentially still an embryo. This is because babies in the egg live off the yolk, which is a travel-sized food source stored within the egg. And once the food runs out and the hunger takes over, the baby has to escape its enclosure, whether it's ready or not. The problem is that two-thirds of the yolk-producing genes have been shut off, apparently in support of milk-producing genes, so that the babies have to hatch prematurely. With metatherians, it's the same way, minus the shell. Their eggs, like ours, hatch when they're still inside the body. They have to, since they don't have any sort of shell, not even a soft one to protect them on the outside. The problem is that their eggs are just like the monotremes' eggs, in that they don't have enough yolk for the baby to develop fully, so their babies are born when they're still an embryo. In this condition, they're utterly helpless and so small that the mother can't even help them. They come out of the womb, out of the birth canal, and then have to, it can only survive if they climb up the mother's fur to reach a teat and latch onto it. And that means that when the mother gives birth, she's helpless too. She can't move around or she'll lose the babies. And before they develop this technique, the mothers weren't able to move around at all. Uh, she would be dependent on the male to provide for her and the young. Not many mammals have a relationship like that. As you know, marsupials got around the significant design flaw by use of a supportive fold of skin on the belly as an enveloping pouch that the baby could climb into to be carried around. And the pouch is called a marsupium. It's how marsupials got their name. 
There is as yet no way to know how their ancestors dealt with this issue before they had a marsupium. Interestingly, not all marsupials have marsupium, and the echidna, a monotreme, does have one. And that means that this pouch is likely a synapomorphy, a trait inherited from a common ancestor that, that was kept in most descendants, but subsequently lost in some lineages like the platypus and, and uh, some opossums that don't have that trait anymore. And obviously, eutherians like us don't have it either. So monotremes don't have enough yolk, and marsupials don't have enough yolk, and eutherians don't have any yolk at all anymore. Now, our eggs still have a yolk sac, but it's empty, it, which is one of many examples of vestigial traits. Thus, it is reasonable to assume that our ancestors didn't have enough yolk either, though there is at this time no way to know that. That is what the evidence indicates. It is possible that our ancestors somehow had sufficient yolk for full development, but that monotremes and metatherians both reduced their milk independently and eutherians somehow lost all of theirs entirely, all of it com you know, completely coincidentally, but that seems improbable. It is far more likely that the ancient mammals shared the same genetic deficiency until eutherians replaced the yolk with placenta, which instead of being an egg, and having to pack out their own lunch and you know being separate from the mother, the placenta allows the fetus to feed directly from the mother in utero. And that would allow them to gestate longer and develop more fully. And what is the evidence for this? Well, for one thing, some marsupials have transitional features in that they have some yolk, which eutherians don't have, but they don't have enough of it. At the same time, some marsupials actually have a rudimentary placenta, which monotremes don't have, Though again, there isn't enough of it, or it isn't it isn't uh, efficient enough to sustain the young. Eutherians have the new and improved version of placenta with structural refinement sufficient to do the job on its own. And it wouldn't matter if the marsupial placenta was sufficient, because another fact to consider is that monotremes and metatherians and all of their ancient ancestors in the fossil record had epipubic bones, such as placental mammals don't have. Now, these forward-facing bones impose a limit on how large a fetus can be and still get through the birth canal. So as the placenta becomes more efficient, allowing the fetus to gestate longer and grow larger inside the mother, being you know, more developed at birth, we now have a natural selection situation wherein the fetus may be too big to get out, meaning that both mother and child would die in the birthing process, except if the mother was born without those epipubic bones, at which point she would be classified as placentalia, just as we are. And that means that after 40 million years of trying to work around such a significant design flaw in their reproduction, placental mammals finally had the ability to either bear a larger brood of siblings than could possibly fit into a single pouch all at once, improving the chance that at least some would survive, or they just ate a single baby so completely that it would be able to walk within minutes of hitting the ground. Either way, having placenta was a game-changing strategy. It is the reason why there are now so many more mammals with a placenta than without. Again, we would not expect a rudimentary placenta to evolve independently in all these marsupial groups, so it too must have been an inherited trait from a common ancestor. And since placental mammals have a more derived or, or advanced version of that, they must have inherited the rudimentary form from a common ancestor with marsupials. And that means that marsupials, or more correctly, metatherians, represent an intermediate stage between egg-laying monotremes and placental mammals like us.